Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Bryn Bartiromo. I'm part of the marketing team here at the foundation. We're just going to give folks um, a few more minutes to log in and then we'll get started around 4.05. Thanks so much. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Danielle Marchione and I'm the manager of the Center for Nonprofit Excellence at Fairfield County's Community Foundation. Thank you for joining us and thank you to our co-sponsor, Near and Far Aid. Today, we will be having a discussion about emergency fundraising in response to COVID-19. This conversation will be recorded and available on FCCF's website on our NPO resource page. As a reminder, this is a voice only session. There will not be a visual presentation. However, we do want this to be an interactive discussion. We will have allotted time to answer your questions, so we invite you to submit your questions in the question box that can be found on the right-hand side of the screen. Please feel free to contribute your questions at any time. We have had more than 140 participants register for this teleconference from all corners of Fairfield County, 
and representatives from both large and small organizations. It reminds us that although we are currently physically distant, we remain socially connected. Our speakers today include Carla Fortunato, President of Connecticut Council for Philanthropy, Mike Rosen, Chief Revenue and Business Development Officer at Fairfield County's Community Foundation, and Karen Brown, Vice President of Development and Philanthropic Services at Fairfield County's Community Foundation. In order to be mindful of time, we will be hearing from our speakers first and saving the question and answer period for after that. We are going to begin with Carla, who will start us off sharing more about the ways different philanthropic organizations are responding to COVID-19. Carla? Hello, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for inviting me to participate in this afternoon's conversation. Um, so I'm Carla Fortunato. I am president of the Connecticut Council for Philanthropy, and that's the state's association for grant makers. Our members include community foundations like Fairfield County's Community Foundation, as well as corporate funders, private foundations, and other public charities like United Ways. And the first message that I want to deliver is that philanthropy in Connecticut, and frankly, philanthropy nationwide is alert and they are paying attention to this crisis. My organization's been running weekly calls for our members and every week 60, 70, 80 funders are joining these calls to get updates because there is a real hunger for good information. People want to know what's happening in communities across Connecticut, what the government response is, what nonprofits are doing and what else is needed. The reality is that the very real needs people are experiencing far outweigh what the philanthropic community alone can do. So given the finite resources, there's a real need to be as efficient and coordinated and creative as we can be right now. Um, I'm not a fundraising expert, but I have worked in the philanthropic community for about 15 years now. And so what I thought that I could do is share some of the things that we're uh, recommending to our members and then make some recommendations to you based on them. So for example, we're encouraging our members to reach out to their grantees, to check in on them, to find out what they need. And even if they can't make grants right now, we're encouraging funders to collect information from their grantees so that they can better understand um, the landscape and how all nonprofits are faring. So what I'd say to you is that it's okay to reach out to your funders. I was on a call uh, last week with um, some nonprofit leaders and one um, confided that she felt really uncomfortable reaching out to people right now. And so certainly understand that many of us are working in, in kind of compromised situations, but it is okay to reach out. Um, let funders know what you need, talk to them about how your work has changed, share what's going well and what's challenging. Um, it's important to understand some may have flexibility to actually support you right now, others won't, but regardless, it's okay to reach out to them and share updates and changes in needs. Um, secondly, we're encouraging our members to make administrative changes that will support their grantees. And my organization is not alone in this. Organizations across the country have been encouraging funders to reduce administrative burdens wherever they can to eliminate or reduce reporting requirements, to reduce the length of their applications. And we're asking them to be realistic in the moment. Maybe think about transitioning project support into general operating support, to allow groups to keep sponsorship dollars even when events can't be held, these kinds of changes. And most of CCP members um, that I've spoken with have been trying to adopt these best practices as well as others. So again, what I would say to you is it's okay to ask a grant maker to consider making some of these kinds of changes, to transition a project grant into general operating support, to enable you to respond to this moment. Um, you might consider asking for an extension on reporting or see if a shortened report could be acceptable. Um, so um, I'd encourage you if you need it to reach out and ask for flexibility. Of course, I can't guarantee that a funder will make these kinds of changes, but many foundations are really trying to reduce the red tape right now and let nonprofits focus on the work we all need them to do most in this moment, and that is not administration. 
On the grant making side of the equation, I can tell you uh, what I see from my perch and funders tend to be responding in three general ways. Our public foundations, these are the foundations that can do fundraising like community foundations and United Ways. They are fundraising. They know the need is great and very early on in this crisis, they launched funds and fundraising efforts to boost their ability to support their nonprofit partners and the communities they serve. Um, and my organization, CCP, has a list of the COVID-19 response funds on our website. Uh, we're in the process of trying to make it even more usable for nonprofits, but we do have kind of lists of funds that are available right now, as well as some other uh, resources that could be useful for nonprofits. So that's that's the one group of funders, um, one, one group of funders. They're fundraising and they're moving money out, out the door right now. Um, some private foundations have allocated some dollars to quickly respond to the urgent needs that exist right now. Often, although not always, they're deepening their support for organizations that they already have relationships with. And often, although not always, they're continuing to provide support with the same focus, um, issue focus or geographic focus that they have historically had. So for example, um, if a foundation has historically focused on homelessness and housing, I see them continuing to support that issue area right now. Other foundations are not responding right now with grant making support. You know, they're keeping their powder dry. They are watching the crisis closely. They're staying connected to their nonprofit partners and they are kind of waiting for the wave to recede. They want to know what the landscape looks like how federal and state governments are responding um, so that they can make sure that they aren't um, providing funding for something that a government agency will fund. So for you, as you're planning your fundraising efforts, I think it's useful to understand that different foundations are really adopting different approaches. Our community foundations and United Ways are raising money and moving it out the door quickly. Some of our private foundations are also responding with some small pots of dollars, generally with the same issue or geographic focus they've had. And other funders are, are holding on to their dollars right now, but they're watching and monitoring and beginning to plan. And if you understand which funders you know, have adopted these different approaches, that'll give you a better sense of who to approach when for support. Um, and don't forget about regional or national funders. Many big foundations are responding with very big dollars. So if you have a relationship with regional or national funders, or you see foundations supporting these national funders, supporting something that you work on, and you have a connection or the capacity to pursue that opportunity, you should go for it. Uh, furthermore, if your organization is innovating, or has developed a creative solution to a problem that is being experienced nationally, and there are a lot of problems that are being experienced nationally right now, that is another time, another good time to look for national support. So national funders often will fund local or statewide efforts that could be models to roll out across the country. So for the innovator, innovators among you, this could be a good time to leverage national philanthropic dollars. Um, and finally, we're encouraging funders to work through existing networks. Um, I've worked with the philanthropic community through a few disasters um, in the last 15 years. And one of the first things that um, uh, disaster philanthropy experts say is that now is the time to work with organizations on the ground with experience. And now is the time to look to the networks that already exist um, for support. So, for example, I'm hearing concern about people in our communities who are undocumented, and several funders have reached out to ask about how to best support this population of folks. Um, and our response was uh, encouraging people to work through established organizations that have been working with these communities for years, um, work with the organizations who are trusted. So I'd say to you, know where your expertise is, lean into it, Partner with others who may not have it to bolster the impact that you can have together. Um, Connecticut is known for its parochialism 
And while there are strengths that come with our local networks, we need to be able to partner and collaborate and coordinate at a far higher level than we've had to do in the past. In fact, that's one of the reasons I'm holding weekly calls with my members, because I know how critical it is for the philanthropic community to coordinate its efforts. We need to be able to share information and priorities and plans for response so that we can support as much work as possible. Um, and I know that it's not philanthropy alone that needs to be coordinating. Uh, there needs to be coordination among and across all of our communities, nonprofits, government players, the business community, philanthropy. So where you see our opportunities for coordination, for leveraging someone else's expertise or work more, for more efficiency or more effectiveness, I encourage you to really uh, take those opportunities. Um, and I just wanna end with a thank you to all of you for the work that you're doing every day during this incredibly challenging time. Excellent, thank you so much, Carla. And now I'm going to turn it over to my FCCF colleagues, Mike and Karen. Thanks so much, uh, Danielle. Uh, and Carla, thank you for, uh, for joining us uh, for, for today's um, call, but also for, for your partnership. Um, you know, we are very fortunate in this state um, to have a, a, a real partner for philanthropy um, in CCP. So thank you for, uh, for everything you do um, for, for the sector. Um, not only in Fairfield County, but uh, across the entire state. Um, so um, just for quick background, um, I've been with uh, the organization for uh, two years next month. Um, and before that was, well, I had spent five prior years in the nonprofit sector. And before that was in the, in the marketing world and marketing communications world. So I'm gonna focus more on donor communications um, and then turn it over to Karen uh, to talk a little bit more about some uh, some other specifics and and sort of the landscape that that we're seeing here at the Community Foundation um, in uh, when it comes to emergency fundraising um, at the Community Foundation uh, when it comes to fundraising, be it in an emergency situation as we're in now, or or frankly in our regular day to day efforts, um, we are really in the business of activating philanthropy. Uh, that's helping to educate, to motivate, and then to activate people who live in, work in or have some kind of connection to Fairfield County to support our collective efforts with all of you to build the capacity and to maximize the impact of our nonprofit sector. Um, and as we like to say, to, to really to close the opportunity gap and give everyone that opportunity to thrive. It's really hard to believe that um, it's been less than two months, uh, February 27th, that was uh, Fairfield County's giving day when about 400 of our peers in the nonprofit sector locally came together. Um, between giving day and the end of this month um, or into early may we will have activated activated an estimated six million dollars in charitable giving um, and that's in approximately two months a little more than two months um, and with the majority of that supporting local nonprofits serving um, our neighbors here in fairfield county and just a quick break breakdown as of earlier this week um, we raised more than 1.65 million dollars in donations on giving day for just shy of 400 nonprofits more than two million dollars in donations have been raised to date for the Fairfield County COVID-19 Resiliency Fund between March 18th when we launched it um, and now. Um, importantly, in that same period since we launched the COVID, our COVID fund, um, more than 1.3 million additional donations to nonprofits have been made by donor advised fund holders at the Community Foundation um, with the overwhelming majority of those dollars staying um, in Fairfield County. Um, and then uh, approximately an additional $1 million in our traditional spring competitive grant cycle will begin rolling out on a rolling basis starting later this month and, and into early May. Um, and he, so here I want to share a little bit about the approach we've taken in our donor communications during this time where, you know, everyone walks the line of urgency, you know, the line between urgency um, and desperation. Um, and it certainly is often like walking a tightrope uh, without a net. Um, some donors, you know, want a factual appeal. Others want more emotional and want you to tug their heartstrings. Um, so you really have to message carefully about what your nonprofit may need in the immediate response, while also thinking, and we've started thinking about it um, most recently in the last couple of weeks, about how and when you pivot to the short and long-term recovery period. You know, who will you be approaching from your donor list um, and when and what will the future hold and what is the ask at that point? 
you know, we, the, I'm going to provide a, a focus here on six key things that I think any development person or any organization should be um, doing, you know, when doing fundraising in time of crisis. But these are not, um, we, we claim no error, error of exclusivity here. If you Google emergency fundraising ideas, you'll find more than 16 million Google results. Um, but the first one, come, you know, we really call being human. So be human. Don't start uh, any communication with be it a current or a prospective donor by just asking for money. Start by asking how they're doing, how the person on that other end of the phone, on the under end of that meal, find out how they're doing. Um, you know, fundraising, we all know, especially in a time of crisis, is about the relationship first. Then you can discuss donations and dollars and the work you're doing. Um, we are helping individuals fulfill their philanthropic interest. We're helping them fill their hearts and fill their minds um, as much as they are helping us all do our work to, um, to help the residents uh, who call Fairfield County home. So that's really one. That human touch is incredibly important and I'll return back to that, that um, as we go throughout the, uh, the other five points. Um, number two is be intentional. The first focus is always on, of course, your largest and or your most loyal donors. I think we all know that. But for everyone, whether they have given to you in the past or they're new to you and they've reached out to you, we need to, at this point, really let people know why, why we're contacting them. Um, for those in the marketing front who may be on the call and others may know him, there's a gentleman by the name of Simon Sinek who has a very famous TED Talk and then a book called Start With Why. Now, he focused more certainly on the consumer front, but I think a lot of the lessons um, that he um, professes really do work as, um, as we are talking about um, emergency fundraising and development, um, certainly now in these days, um, but development in general. Um, you, we need to let people know right now why you're contacting them, why your organization exists, why it matters now, why the work that we are all doing, that you or your organization is doing matters now more than ever. But most importantly, why that individual on the other side of that phone call or email, um, why they can trust you and your organization to put their charitable dollars and perhaps just as important, their passions to good use. Um, so knowing your why is really critical. It's critical all the time in fundraising. It's even more important right now. Um, you know, Simon Sinek says people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And if we can be real focused as a, as a, um, as a sector on the why of our work, um, I think we can really make a, a big difference and really engage more people and activate more people in philanthropic care. Number three, is to be transparent. Share as much as you can about how that emergency funding is going to be used and follow up, follow up, follow up. Provide updates on the impact donors have helped you achieve. It is critical. We hear it all the time. We've already, so we've, we launched our, our COVID response fund just over a month ago. Within two weeks, we were getting emails and phone calls from those who have given saying, How's the money being used? Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we've adapted um, to those inquiries um, as we've moved along over the last month, um, which goes right into number four. During the time of an emergency in particular, you need to be as flexible and as nimble as you possibly can be. While many of us have had to pivot our fundraising and while our, our program teams have also had to pivot their programming focus in the past you know, a month and a half, two months. We've found at the Community Foundation that the one, one of the reasons, at least, that our COVID-19 Resiliency Fund has been successful is that we, for lack of a better phrase, stuck to our knitting in terms of our focus areas. Um, Carla mentioned that she's seeing in these times that folks are turning to organizations that they know and trust on the ground. Um, donors already trusted us to help our region's nonprofits in the four primary categories that we are supporting through our COVID-19 fund, mental and physical health, education, employment and economic security, and housing. However, we did at the very beginning make a very conscious choice, and let there be no doubt, this has been a um, 
hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder partnership um, at our organization between our development team and our community impact team. Um, we made a very conscious choice to open up the application process to the broader community of 501c3 and 501c4 organizations in and serving our region, not just those who had previously received grants from us. Um, and we have granted more than $1.35 million in, um, over, the, over the first month, um, including to many first-time grantees of the Community Foundation. You know, we also knew that while our development team had to focus on moving as quickly as possible to generate donations, our community impact team has had to move just as rapidly and with even greater urgency to thoughtfully review the funding requests to get those dollars back into the community where there is so much need. You know, one thing Carla talked about is streamlining applications. We've done that. We made our application for um, COVID funding far more um, streamlined and far faster to complete than uh, previously. And, you know, it's, uh, and, and it's made a difference, we believe, and we've heard that from some of our partners. This all ties back um, when it comes to fundraising to that need to be transparent about how funds are being used and to be able to adapt as you go. So we initially only listed the names of grantees who received funding in the first round of grant making we did about a week and a half to two weeks after we opened the fund. That first round of grant making was about half a million dollars. Um, but we received um, we received phone calls and emails almost immediately from donors that they wanted more. So when we released the second round of grant funding that has now totaled, as I said, more than 1.35 million, um, we updated our website to include brief descriptions for how each organization is using those funds. Um, and we've heard feedback, we've heard thank yous from those who contacted us, those donors who had given, um, and we've heard from new folks at how easy it's been to find information. So that transparency, I think, has been very, very important. We're also even starting to, we've asked some grantees, though they are very busy, to share testimonials in writing about the impact of the funding that, that, uh, that we are receiving and that they are then, that we are then passing along to our partners in the nonprofit sector. It's something that, again, helps humanize our collective impact. Um, we're even gonna start asking if they might be able to provide some very short 30 and 60 second videos. You know, one of the, the benefits is of, of technology these days, in addition to our being able to still stay in touch and stay in contact despite social distancing, um, is everyone, most people have a, a cell phone with a video camera um, that you don't have to hold on your shoulder anymore. Um, so short 30 or 60 second videos to provide again, that more personal connection to the work is great for social media, for websites, et cetera. Um, finally, in this section, I'd say also, don't forget to engage your board to extend your development team. Um, now more than ever, in terms of being flexible and nimble, we need to ask our boards to participate in that process. Number five is to be consistent. Um, among the most difficult things to do in a time of crisis is to find the right balance in terms of the frequency of communications. You definitely don't wanna pester or annoy donors with too much information too frequently, because remember, they're not only getting an email from you. Um, you know, they're not only seeing in their social media feed uh, the posts from you. So we've had success, and we've always find balance, and we talk about it all the time. We've had success with one weekly update, very concise, um, leading with whatever we believe the most important news of that week has been whether that is how much grant funding we've put out to the to community to confirm and again for transparency show those who have given um, how money is being used. We have always include a direct link to our list of grantees with the descriptions of how they're using those funds um, to updates and resources as, as Danielle had mentioned about our COVID-19 nonprofit resource page because we speak to both our supporters and donors and nonprofit partners. Um, and we support it through social media that's updated two to three times per week with our, with our, 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 our marketing team. Um, we also include members of the local media on our email updates um, and direct outreach to keep them informed as well. If you do have relationships with local media, they are covering this, they are covering all facets of it, um, of, the, of the crisis, and they want to hear from you on this front. The final um, recommendation, um, and I stole this one, um, is to be fearless. Um, Gene Case has a great book called Be Fearless, Five Principles for a Life of Breakthroughs and Purpose. That's one of my 
uh, favorite books from the past year or two. Um, I think it's a great read for those of us in the nonprofit sector, especially those involved with fundraising, because we have no choice um, but to be fearless. Um, we all have had to grow thick skins because we're used to hearing no thank you. Um, everyone is well intended, but it doesn't mean they always say yes. Um, that's just part of our business that we are all in. Um, but the fifth of Jean's Be Fearless principles is to let urgency conquer fear. Um, she says, and, and I'm quoting right from the book, don't overthink it. It's natural to want to study all angles of a problem, but don't get caught up in the fear of what could go wrong. Allow the need to act to outweigh doubts. This is um, a quote I've read to our board. I've read to our, uh, our full team here. Um, we need, you know, I think in certainly in moments of crisis, this sentiment of allowing the need to act to outweigh doubts um, is even more important. It doesn't mean that you should um, be rushed over being right. And, you know, in these times with people getting a lot of communications, you need to make sure those communications are relevant. Spelling matters, you know, um, grammar matters. Um, but do not have fear of what could go wrong. Act. Um, we all need to act because I think what we've noticed, is, you know, for us is one of the other reasons our fund was successful is we got out early. Um, we moved really quickly. Um, and now I'm going to hand things off to uh, to my partner in uh, FCCF's development efforts, Karen Brown. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, know Karen. She's certainly one of the most informed and insightful people uh, uh, around. Um, no, Karen leads our fundraising efforts for the COVID fund, you know, the COVID-19 Resiliency Fund, guides much of our day-to-day -day donor stewardship, and she's going to talk more about uh, what we're seeing in terms of, uh, of the landscape. Karen. Thank you, um, um, Mike. I'm going to um, talk about some trends and tips, um, as well as throw in um, some lessons learned that that we've experienced and observed since launching the COVID Resiliency Fund on March 18th. And some of this will, um, some of these um, comments will uh, reflect back on what Carla and, and Mike um, also shared. First, um, some general tips about approaching donors um, during this time. Um, first, um, the, the crisis can be um, a important time to create uh, new, brand new donor relationships. We certainly saw this um, at the Community Foundation. So I would encourage the nonprofits on this call to get out your donor prospect lists and look through them carefully and think about approaching some brand new prospects uh, during this time. It can be, um, it can be a fruitful um, exercise. And as Mike said, be sure that you're using your board of directors to help you do this. Also, um, think carefully about soliciting donors who may be specifically hurting as a result of the crisis. This can be hard to always know, um, but try to be mindful. Um, in, for example, now um, individuals connected to the real estate and restaurant sectors um, may be especially financially hurting, so I would be mindful about potentially approaching um, those donors. Uh, another um, observation: Early donor solicitations can, for crisis funding, can be can can be tricky. Sometimes an early solicitation can get lost in the very very early days of a crisis when everyone is scrambling and figuring out the new normal. However, other times, um, as Mike mentioned, the earlier that you can approach a donor or a donor prospect, the more likely you might be able to get a gift. Um, why is this the case? Um, very obviously, because um, in a very short period of time after a crisis, many other nonprofits will be doing the same thing. And um, so having um, your development um, work orchestrated early um, in a crisis like this can be um, extremely um, important. In terms of making the ask, um, make a clear ask for funding. Be very specific about what you need and why. Don't include a lot of fluff. Highlight why and how your organization is serving a gap or helping those left behind. Focus your ask specifically on what is urgently needed rather than nice-to-haves. Funders can tell the difference between the two. Savvy donors also ask very thoughtful, 
hard questions about crisis funding requests. Donors want to know how fast funding to beneficiaries is being deployed, how it is being done, who is making the decisions, and how diverse needs are being prioritized. You need to have thoughtful answers to all of these questions before you start making your donor asks. Challenge grants matter a lot. Many donors remarked to the Community Foundation development team that they were incentivized to give to our resiliency fund, even at small levels, because of the two generous challenge grants the Community Foundation received and publicized. Many local nonprofits, some of you on this call, were also able to develop um, and cultivate uh, incentivizing challenge grants. So I would encourage you to think about how powerful challenge grants can be. Nonprofit collaborations matter a lot during crisis funding. You've heard this before a million times. Funders really like to see nonprofits working together. The Foundation's COVID Resiliency Fund made two important grants to Opening Doors Fairfield County, a collective impact initiative focused on ending homelessness in our region. Sometimes in a crisis, nonprofits can forget about how they can raise potentially more money by approaching a grant maker with a truly collaborative ask. If you're not putting forth a collaborative proposal, show how you are coordinating your work with a community harbor master, such as our three Cradle to Career Collective Impact Initiatives here in Fairfield County, or if you are working in the arts sector, our two cultural alliances. And as Mike mentioned earlier, think about the future. What are you learning now about the crisis that may help inform what you may need in your organization in our region three, six, nine months from now? And share those observations and thoughts with, you, with your donors. It's important because it shows that you are thinking about the recovery phase, and that is something that your funders want to see you do. I want to make a few points um, about working with the public sector. As Carla mentioned, um, when there is federal stimulus dollars in play, it's critical for philanthropy to understand specifically where there will be gaps in funding to ensure that there's no duplication of resources. This can also be a slow and arduous process to discern. We heard uh, from our colleagues that the Connecticut Office uh, of Policy and Management has had to pour over hundreds and hundreds of pages of brand new federal funding regulations to understand specific gaps that private philanthropy in Connecticut might potentially address. This is really, really important for foundations because philanthropy likes to stay in its lane and not overlap with where the public sector has a responsibility. Also, in related, related to public sector, always talk about how your nonprofit is working with the public sector in a crisis, how you're working with municipal and state government. This shows that you are entangled with the public sector, which many funders want to see. Share with your donors openly where you see our public sector doing a good job, and where you see specific opportunities for improvement or even future systems change. And emphasize in your, in your communications with donors and foundations where your nonprofit has played a unique and important role vis-a-vis -vis the public sector. Finally, I want to highlight some trends that we are watching and I encourage you to, to watch as well. We saw early in this crisis a very strong interest on the part of individual donors in particular, their interest in getting emergency cash into the hands of people in need. This is an important trend that was in place before COVID and it certainly is getting a lot of attention at this time. So nonprofits which are raising money for direct financial assistance for their clients with financial need, need to tell the story about why they are best positioned to manage these philanthropic dollars. 
I'll give you one example. Uh, one of our grantees, which works with immigrants, shared very extensive, thoughtful cash assistance policies that they have developed. They were involved in cash assist, direct cash assistance to their clients before COVID, and they're involved in this work in an even more heightened way now. And they shared with us very, very extensive, thoughtful policies that their organization developed and has updated over time in managing cash assistance made, made possible through gifts from individual donors and foundations. And these policies showed us that they really know how to manage this kind of assistance well, and therefore are deserving of gifts from individual donors, donor advised funds, and other philanthropic entities. Another trend that's important is, is to watch is that corporations are, that offer matching gifts are really incentivizing employee giving. We saw this with the COVID Resiliency Fund. And Candid, the Foundation Center, reports that companies in the United States gave 3.7 billion since, since mid-March, responding extremely quickly and with very large gifts um, through corporate philanthropy. Crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing, as you all know, is a, is a frequent strategy used by local communities and residents to respond in a crisis. There were several GoFundMe sites in Fairfield County got launched very early on, ranging from those helping impacted specific families to local restaurants that had to close, et cetera. However, when these GoFundMe sites start to grow quickly, and they often do, they, they do need 501c3 status to garner more traditional gifts that will require tax deductions. And therefore, they often need to quickly secure nonprofit fiscal sponsors. This is an important trend to, to, to watch because nonprofits, including many of you on this call, can be those fiscal sponsors and can potentially earn a fee for doing so. I want to be mindful, though, that choosing to be a fiscal sponsor requires careful due diligence on the part of the nonprofit. And you also need to be able to charge an appropriate fee for the work, which, which can be considerable. Finally, um, I want to just share a really important, um, interesting fact from Candid um, Foundation Center. Of the 530 COVID relief funds established in the United States since mid-March, 373 of the 530 COVID relief funds were housed at community foundations across the country in towns and cities, large and small. In general, most of these COVID funds were place-based and not focused on identity-specific populations, with some exceptions focused on um, immigrant communities, people of color, and people with disabilities. I encourage you to visit candid.org, C-A-N-D-I-D.org. Candid has the best list of new COVID funds across the country and is updated daily. And you can see, um, to Carla's earlier point, the opportunity for some national fund, COVID funds um, that might pertain to your organization. I also want to put um, a plug in for the Nonprofit Finance Fund. The Nonprofit Finance Fund is a national organization that is best in class for helping nonprofits during times of crisis, as well as normal times, conduct financial scenario planning. We believe that we're entering a very difficult market um, economy and that many of our nonprofits need to do financial scenario planning. Please visit Nonprofit Finance Fund to, to obtain some amazing resources that can help you, your colleagues, and your board conduct financial scenario planning. And then finally, um, I want you to encourage you to visit the website of one of our grantees, Pro Bono Partnership. They've been an important partner to the Center for Nonprofit Excellence. And the Pro Bono Partnership has some excellent materials on their website about some of the charitable uh, tax, uh, charitable deduction expansions that are allowable in the recently passed CARES Act. Thanks a lot.
Excellent. Thank you so much, Karen. And thank you to you too, Mike. Thank you for uh, filling us all in. And now I, I recommend you enter your questions in the question box. We already have a couple that have come in. So I want to pass those on to you. Um, the first question is, what guidance can you give for agencies that are in a essential business, uh, but not treating COVID patients. We are an essential substance use agency. Um, Mike, do you have any ideas about that one? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Danielle and, and Karen and, and Carla again, great job. And, and uh, thank you for the questions. Um, regarding, you know, um, being an essential business about not treating COVID patients, and certainly I could speak for our fund, but I believe uh, that it's general. You, you don't need to certainly be treating COVID patients um, to be eligible for, for funding. Um, I know that there's also been a, certainly a rise, and as I look through um, the list of grantees that we've already given, there were at least a half dozen um, for, uh, nonprofit organizations that we've provided funding for in various uh, health areas for telehealth services, for example. Um, so I think it goes back to where I spoke earlier about you know the why. Um, you know, when you're applying for grant funding, but whether you're delivering a message individually to a donor, to a, a foundation, um, to a response fund, um, like, like the one we have, um, explain your connection and the impact of COVID on the service that you normally provide. Um, you don't have to be treating COVID patients to be explicitly and dramatically impacted by this. And the, um, in this case, the, the, the need um, for um, to continue to deliver substance uh, abuse and substance use services um, to your clients um, is just as important, if not more important, as it was before the COVID crisis hit. So I really think it's important, you know, to to deliver that message of why the COVID crisis has impacted your ability to deliver, to, uh, deliver services, why and how the funding will be used uh, during that time, be it telehealth services or PPE to protect your patients and staff um, during this time, whatever the actual need may be. I think it's also important of, you know, in our fund, about 45% of the grant making that we've done to date were in the areas of mental or physical health. Um, so I would, I would certainly encourage you to, to, um, to look around for those who are, who are funding um, services, you know, in the telehealth world or whatever your specific need is, you don't have to have had uh, patients directly impacted. Um, who are who are who have tested positive for for COVID nineteen? Excellent, thank you, Mike. And next question coming in: How does an organization respond when lay leadership is reluctant to fundraise for fear of being insensitive to community who may be struggling? Any thoughts on that? Karen, do you want to take that one? Yeah, that's. Um, I think that that's that's a hard one. Um, it relates to my question about being mindful about who to approach. Um, uh, I think that one of the things that we've been we've been concerned about is, or just thinking about, is to not make assumptions about whether uh, you know a donor may be able to give or an individual may be able to give. I think that. A lot of people, um, even those who've been um, directly impacted, are wa wanting to help and wanting to give. Um, and um, I, I think that you know you have to do it carefully. Um, you have to. You might do a focus group or um, some kind of uh, way to sort of get some data on, on how it would be perceived, so that you actually have some data behind this this um, leadership concern, lay leadership concern, rather than functioning off of assumptions. Um, that's probably how I would approach it. Um, but it's important not to make assumptions and, and to try to get data. But if you decide that if you have a late, you know, board member or lay leader that's saying um, this is not the time to uh, solicit for gifts. And, and I would just add, add, you know, add to that, and this is Mike, um, it does go back to, to what we all said. It, it is about you need to know who you're speaking to in your audience, but it's about the personal relationship that you, you want to build first but instead of the direct ask. You know, um, Juanita James, our president and CEO, um, uh, wrote an op-ed that ran 
in um, the Hearst newspapers and the, you know, the New York Hour, Stanford Advocate, et cetera, um, a, a Sunday or two ago, and talked about, you know, if you're in a position to pay it forward, you can make a real difference. Um, but it doesn't all, also need to be with, with dollars necessarily. Nonprofits right. are looking for volunteers. Nonprofits are looking for other support for networks. For networks, you know, you may not be able to give, but you may know someone who can. Who right. can. So I think you also need to, um, you know, um, to have those conversations with your lay leadership um, about what giving means during this time. There's no question that the financial resources is, is paramount. Um, but, you know, I think there's tremendous evidence that this crisis does bring out the best in people and people will dig deep. You just need to um, be sensitive to it and, and ask, how are you doing? Um, and if you have the means, you would love it. But if not, that's OK, too. And I think we need to be OK with, with, with that. Um, there is that line you always walk. Excellent. Thank you. The next question is, when applying for grants, is it too risky to ask too much? to request at the top of the range publicized by the funder? I think I'll, I'll take that one, Danielle. Um, I think it's fine to ask for the top of the range um, and be very clear about why. So um, again, you know, emphasizing um, why you need the largest amount possible, um, why your funding request is urgent and needed, um, and you know, make the case for it in your application. So it's completely um, fine to do that. Um, just make sure you've got you know a really good case statement behind you. Excellent. Thank you, Karen. And uh, the last question I have here um, is a question on thoughts on virtual fundraising events. Right. Um, these are really tricky because we're in uncharted territory. Um, so um, we don't we don't have a lot of data about how a virtual fundraising event that attracted 250 or more people um, uh, can accomplish fundraising goals. Um, one nonprofit um, that ha took the brave step to um, conduct a virtual fundraiser in place of its in-person luncheon is Planned Parenthood of Southern New England, based in with headquarters in New Haven. Um, they conducted their virtual fundraiser two weeks ago, I believe, um, and um, may have some good insights to share. Um, about doing a, um, a virtual fundraiser um, with a large number in the audience. Um, so I would encourage you to kind of talk to peers um, about who may have done this already or thinking. Um, I also think that um, the Association of Fundraising Professionals, um, which some of you may be members of, and I encourage you to consider being members of, um, AFP, Association of Fundraising Professionals, has an incredible website and there is a ton of information on that website about virtual fundraisers. And for AFP members who get their list listserv, there's been a very steady um, listserv cha uh, tra uh, trail um, around the pros and cons and thoughts and considerations into hosting um, a virtual fundraising event. Excellent, thank you. And I believe uh, Siri, Connecticut Institute for Refugees and Immigrants, just had a Siri night in recently. So they okay. may be another colleague um, that you could reach out to. We did just get another question in, and we do have some time. So um, here it is. We have more and more volunteers saying they want to donate food or money to our families specifically. We started out by directing them to other community providers who specialize in getting food and assistance into the community but it seems they want to do it all through us because we have relationships with our families. There is not a high number asking, so I'm exploring what, how to help bridge this gap. What considerations should we be thinking about in developing a very small scale program of, of providing immediate cash assistance to our families? I would, um, I would encourage you to find a partner um, to work with that um, may have the apparatus in place already for delivering um, immediate cash assistance. Um, as I mentioned earlier in my remarks, I think 
there's actually a lot of work involved in doing this the right way. And that this is not a program you plan on offering in the future, um, but rather now because in this in this period of time, I would encourage you instead to um, work with a um, a partner um, that may be already set up to provide cash assistance. And if you have any questions about who that partner might be, please give us a call at the Community Foundation, and we will uh, brainstorm with you who that might be. I think it's um, a lot of work to get this these kinds of programs off the ground, and um, it may not be the right thing for you to be doing um, at this time. And I, I would echo that that sentiment as well, you know, going back to what we talked about of, of sticking to your knitting. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the concern with a with doing something like that, while very well intended, is that it could become a distraction. And if it grows beyond, once word spreads, it could become a distraction to your core mission. Um, and, but, and in doing so, it could become a distraction to your core need for fundraising. Um, so I do think that uh, finding partners on that is, is probably the best route to go. And, and as Karen said, um, as, as we come you know, to an end, certainly we are here to, um, to help to bounce around ideas, um, to help provide resources, um, you know, et cetera. So please uh, do, do not hesitate to reach out. And in addition, you know, certainly our, our nonprofit resource page, CCP's page, um, website have, have a lot of varying, um, you know, links to various resources to, uh, to review it. To review. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you so much to Carla Fortunato from CCP. Thank you to Mike Rosen and Karen Brown of FCCF. Um, as Mike was saying, I do want to uh, just give a shout out for our uh, nonprofit resource page again. Um, we do also, I know Karen mentioned um, financial planning. We do have some uh, a webinar uh, linked to on our trainings and webinars portion of the resource page related to navigating COVID-19 for nonprofits from financial triage to scenario planning by the Wallace Foundation um, that is really helpful. So I wanted to point that out as well. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. Um, and thank you to our co-sponsor Near and Far Aid. And please be in touch. Uh, and we uh, welcome you to attend our future uh, responsive curriculum as we continue um, to roll this out uh, to support our nonprofits during this time. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Stay healthy. Thank you.